Good afternoon and welcome. I'm very delighted that you are here for the Oxford launch of Jean's new book, Sense and Solidarity, Jolawala Economics for Everyone. My name is Sabina al Khair, and I work with the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative in this department, which with the South Asia Studies and Oxford India Center for Sustainable Development uh, groups in this university are really delighted to co-host um, this event and we're very, very humbled that Jean has been able to join us um, from Delhi. Sense and Solidarity, which you may read later, is compellingly written, lyrical and succinct, and, but it's also a bit tongue-in-cheek and the voice is a bit of challenge. Particularly for us here, the first, chapters, uh, the first chapter addresses economics among the road scholars. Described as young men, many emaciated and disheveled, pushing bicycles with 200 kilograms of coal, uh, smuggled coal. These road scholars differ greatly from the Rhodes scholars um, that reside just a couple blocks away. And I think that's the distance that we're wanting to cover, and I'm so glad that you are here to try to do so. So in that spirit, um, I, we will begin with a short video which introduces the kinds of places and issues that Jean works on and then turn over to a presentation by Jean of the book, knowing that many of you have not read it, but it is for sale there after the seminar. And after Jean speaks, Matthew McCartney, Duncan Green, Soumya Mishra and Amog Sharma will offer their reflections and then we'll open up this mic for interchange and discussions. Um, so that's the format, and we will close at 2.30. I know that some of you have to leave at 2 o'clock. Um, Jean has been introduced. Um, so, Jean, you can cover your ears. <laughs> that's a little bit been done in advance. Um, and I think that many of you know that although he studied economics, um, he's also interfaced um, very much with different communities, with local social movements, and with the larger political spaces, and this is why he's of interest to many of you who come from different intersections with his work. And of course, many of you will have read the Probe Report or the books that he co-authored with Amartya Sen. And so I know already that you know him, that you're excited for this event. So without delay, we'll turn, Felipe, to the video. You're in the corner, Jean. Oh, yeah. You're still visible. Okay. Okay. I'm here. 
से वो नहीं देता राशन मेरे नानी को उससे पहले नानी को सिर्फ मिलता था हालांकि ये लोग नौ मतलब पूरा परिवार नौ सिर्फ नानी का नाम था तो सिर्फ नानी को साढ़े चार किलो पहले देता था उसके बाद से फिर नहीं देता हमारे एक ही आदमी का नाम है एक ही आदमी को अच्छा कोई से कबर रेस्टोर से ना हमरा बुढ़िया भी जाके ले लात थी हमरा बच्चा लोग भी जाके लाता था लेकिन ये ठेपा वाला में हम लोग को बहुत कठिनाई एक रोज गए ठेपा लगाए नहीं उठा जब वह धुआं का बे धुआं के गलो नहीं उठने अच्छा जाओ दो सौ दिन आते चले आओ दो सौ दिन नहा धुआं के जाओ आर उसका बाद में है ठेपा मार तो उठ ही गई मुझे घर के भी बना होनी तो जमीन के बेच के घर बना हो बेटी के शादी करो एक सौ सत्तर भाड़ा कहती 
Okay, Jean, it's over to you. Hello. <laughs> I have not seen or heard anything during the film, so I trust that it was the right film. Uh, and that you can hear me now, because I still can't see anything. Um, so maybe I should start. Can you confirm that you're hearing me? Yeah? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Uh, let me start with a few words about uh, the background of the film and why I thought it might be a good idea to show it to introduce the discussion. Uh, this film was made by student volunteers uh, in this, on the sidelines of a survey that we conducted last June uh, in the state of Jharkhand, where I live in eastern India, a survey of the public distribution system. So what happens is that almost every year during the summer holidays, uh, we take students to the field sometimes to look at schools, sometimes health centers, public distribution system, uh, pensions or other social programs. It's called hard work, no pay. Uh, in fact, the first year when we did this, it was called hard work, low pay, because at that time we had some sort of research grant, so we thought that we should give some basic remuneration to the student volunteers, uh, something like the minimum wage for agricultural laborers. So we circulated an announcement called Hard Work Low Pay, and there was an overwhelming response. So the following year, we called it Hard Work No Pay, and there were even more uh, volunteers. So ever since, we've been doing this from time to time. And it has been a really very rewarding experience, uh, both to work with very motivated and talented students, and also to go out uh, to the field and uh, observe how these programs work, and very importantly, uh, meet and listen uh, to the people concerned. Uh, so this is the first point that I was hoping would come out of this film, is the value and importance of uh, talking and listening uh, to people. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of interest today in what is called evidence-based policy. And if uh, the intention is to say that uh, we should bring more evidence to bear on public policy. Obviously, it cannot be a bad thing, provided that we take a broad view of what evidence is. And it seems to me, for instance, that the testimonies presented in the film are a very important and valid form of evidence, even though it's not of a kind of standard statistical form. Uh, indeed, we learn from them things that would not be easy to learn from uh, statistic an statistical analysis, for instance. Uh, for instance, we learned the tremendous importance of the public distribution system in that area for poor people. Um, I can't see anything. Am I supposed to? I thought I was supposed to be able to see you. So maybe you should check if everything is all right. Yeah. I knew that the technical problems would be at your end and not at this end. But anyway, I'll continue and assume that you can see me. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, 
so I was saying that uh, we can learn from this sort of work uh, things that supplement in a very important way what, what, can, what we can learn from more traditional forms of research like statistical analysis. And not only can we learn important things about the facts, for example, in this case, as I said, the importance of the public distribution system for poor people, which is something that uh, is not obvious. I mean, if you were to try to educate yourself about the public distribution system in India from the mainstream media, where the system is constantly disparaged, because obviously what comes out in the media is the stories of corruption and failure. Or even if you were to try to learn about it from academic papers published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, I think you would have a very incomplete view of it. And in particular, you would not realize how, what it means for poor people. And not only are we able, by listening to them, to learn about the facts, but we are also learning how they feel and what their views are. And that, again, for me, is a very important form of evidence. For instance, through this film, uh, we learn the sense of injustice that people feel when they are deprived of their food rations, which are now legal entitlements under the National Food Security Act in India, because of biometric failures. Now, if you're sitting in an air-conditioned room in Delhi and you see that the transaction failures are 5 or 10 percent of all transactions, that may, that may seem all right, that may look like a reasonable rate of success. But when you go and meet people and you see how that translates into extreme hardship and deprivation and indeed injustice for people who are on the margin of subsistence for the first place, you may take a different view. Uh, so one way to put this is to say that um, not only is evidence important, but so is experience. In fact, I would say that experience is a form of evidence, uh, certainly for the person concerned. When we move around, talk to people, observe how things go, we learn things, uh, and that's a kind of evidence. The problem with that evidence is not that it's inferior in any way. I think the problem with experience is that it's a form of evidence that can be difficult to share because to learn from other people's experience, we have to trust them, and it's not always clear whether we have good grounds to do so. So I think the way to deal with that is to create forums where we can share our experiences and debate them and confront them and try to move forward together. Um, there's another thing that I thought the film would convey, which is that when we do this sort of work, uh, like field surveys, for example, uh, we are confronted with people who live in conditions of extreme deprivation and indeed exploitation, sometimes also exposed to violence and other forms of injustice. And then the question arises, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to just collect data and go away and write uh, research papers? Um, and that doesn't seem like a very satisfactory answer. And that is why we have tried over the years to develop a somewhat different approach to research, uh, where research is integrally linked with public action. Uh, this is the uh, idea of what we call research for action, where research is part of a larger effort to achieve practical change through democratic action. By democratic action, I mean action using all the dem democratic means available, whether it's research, public debates, uh, legal action, democratic politics, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, I think that most researchers, of course, do want their research to have some sort of practical impact. Uh, of course, you can also do research for other motives, uh, to earn money or for career objectives, and that's fair enough. Uh, but I think that many people in academia would also like to contribute to practical change. But I think we tend to take a narrow view of how that happens. Uh, typically, the way it is thought about is that you should end an academic paper with a section called policy implications, and then somehow hope that the so-called policymakers will happen to read your paper and be inspired by it. Now, of course, that doesn't happen very often because the so-called policymakers, insofar as they exist at all, uh, don't spend much time reading ac academic papers, let alone acting on them. So uh, part of the idea of research for action is that we don't address ourselves 
only to the government. Of course, government is important, public policy is important, but there are also many ways of changing the way things are. And even if your concern is ultimately with public policy, uh, in a democratic system like India has by and large, uh, public policy itself is the outcome of a democratic process that involves not only the government, but also a range of other institutions like the courts, the media, the trade unions, the political parties, citizens' organizations, and so on and so forth. And so as economists or social scientists, we have good reasons to address ourselves to that entire audience and not to the government alone. In other words, we are not just government advisors. Uh, in the academic culture, I think that there is some resistance to the idea of linking uh, research with action because of a misleading notion that involvement in action detracts from objectivity and sound research. So the fear is that if you get involved in action, then you will not be able to see things for what they are. You will be become very subjective, subjective and driven by your convictions and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that this is a misconception because objectivity does not mean that you have to become passive and abdicate your convictions. Objectivity is about honesty and open-mindedness and willingness to accept the facts even when they differ from what we would like to see. I think that is basically uh, what the, uh, uh, the mindset that we should try to cultivate as researchers, but that does not require us to abdicate uh, our convictions and beliefs. I also feel that uh, it's a mistake to think that the university campus is a kind of neutral ground uh, to which we can remove ourselves and from which we can uh, look at the world objectively because the university system is actually increasingly well integrated with other centers of power. For example, there's a revolving door between economics departments, uh, finance ministries, the World Bank and even the corporate sector. And so it's an illusion to think that uh, it's a kind of neutral object ground. If the ground on which we stand is going to be biased anyway, we might as well be out there uh, with people who are, uh, fighting for their rights. And I would go further and reiterate what I said earlier, that involvement in action can be a great learning experience. Uh, that is something that uh, uh, I have learned uh, in a very practical way in the last few years through involvement uh, with various campaigns for social and economic rights in India, like the right to food and the right to work. Uh, I have learned things that uh, I would have found it quite hard to work, uh, to learn uh, just by reading books or writing papers, uh, certainly in the field of economics. For example, through this kind of work, one becomes much better aware of the nature of democratic institutions. And in the case of India, in particular, uh, one becomes aware of how uh, oppressive the social system is and how hostile many of these institutions are to poor people. And I think that's a very important insight for purposes of public policy. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, many of you probably know that India has one of the best and strongest, I can see you now, including Chris uh, on the front, front row, now you've disappeared again. Anyway, um, uh, so I was referring to the to India's Right to Information Act, which is considered one of the best in the world, I think for good reasons, uh, very widely used by millions of people in different contexts. And one of the reasons why this act is so good and so effective is that it was largely framed by activists who had a very sharp sense of these social inequalities and of the need to load the act overwhelming in favor of the people who are going to, write, to apply uh, for information for the government and making the government as accountable as possible. And one could say similar, th similar things about the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. I think if that act had been drafted by economists uh, sitting around the table uh, and not sufficiently aware of uh, how uh, hostile or at least indifferent to poor people some of the democratic institutions are in India, we would have had a very different and much weaker 
Employment Guarantee Act. So uh, these are some of the uh, ideas that are developed in the introduction of the book, which is mainly about research methods and in particular about uh, the possibility and the case for linking research with, with action. If I can take the liberty of quoting my own book, I will end this particular issue by uh, reading a few lines from the introduction, uh, which say that if the idea of evidence-based policy is to bring more evidence to bear on public policy, there is much to be said for it. This endeavor, however, is likely to be all the more useful if we bear in mind that evidence is more than randomized controlled trials, knowledge is more than evidence, policy more than knowledge, and action more than policy. Um, now coming to the substance of the book, it's basically uh, about various aspects of social development in India. Uh, social development in a very broad sense, which would include not only the traditional concerns, like for this example, uh, health, education, and social security, but also other larger issues like social inequality, caste, discrimination, corruption, violence, communalism, and so on and so forth, which I think uh, have to be brought into the picture as well. Uh, it's basically a collection of essays that were written in the last 15 years or so, a period of rapid change in social policy in India and a period during which many important initiatives have taken place, for example, the Right to Information Act, which I referred to earlier, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the National Food Security Act, the Forest Rights Act, the Right to Education Act, and also other important initiatives in related fees like social security pensions and even more recently maternity entitlements. So the book tries to give a sense of the debates and indeed some of the battles that led to these initiatives and look at some of the uh, impact that they had. Uh, many of them, as you would have noticed, are actually laws. They are not just policies. And the importance of putting some of these uh, social benefits in a legal framework and making them legal entitlements uh, arises from this feature that I've already referred to, that India, despite being a democratic country, is a place where uh, large numbers of poor people actually don't count for very much and don't have much of a voice because they are constantly struggling to survive and have low levels of education and few social connections and so on and so forth. Uh, and therefore, putting in place laws that give them legal entitlements is a way of forcing the system and public policy in particular to pay attention to them and give them their due and uh, take their interests into account. Uh, perhaps I should give a couple of examples of what I have in mind and starting with a relatively successful example of uh, social initiative in the last few years in India. Uh, you must have heard of the uh, midday meal scheme in India, the school lunch program. Um, I noticed that Sabina has arranged for snacks in this seminar, and I'm sure that this has contributed to uh, higher attendance. Uh, the universal and irresistible attraction of free food is something I have observed in many different contexts, uh, from the London School of Economics to the Delhi School of Economics and Indian villages. And it's partly because of this irresistible attraction of free food that 15 years ago, a demand was made that cooked meals should be served in the schools in India because at that time the attendance rates were still very low and in particular the enrollment of girls was extremely low and so it was thought that providing school meals would be a way of attracting the children to the schools and indeed it had a dramatic impact in that respect. Uh, the midday meal is a good example of the point of does not emerge from uh, experts and policy makers sitting around the table and thinking, oh, it wouldn't it be a good idea to introduce meals in uh, primary schools. It happened through a lot of public action and campaigns of various kinds, uh, starting by and large with a, an order of the Supreme Court on the 28th of November 2001, when the uh, court directed the state governments to introduce cooked meals in schools. And that, uh, then after that, a lot of 
public advocacy and action to make sure that the orders would be implemented uh, against a certain amount of resistance from the state governments, which claim to be not to have the money for it, uh, sometimes from upper caste parents who didn't like the idea that their children would be eating with lower caste children, uh, sometimes from corporate interests. Uh, there was in particular, or there have been actually several efforts from commercial entities like the biscuit industry in particular to invade the mid meal program and get cooked, meal, cooked meals replaced with biscuits. So there was, it was basically a big democratic battle and it took a long time for the orders to be implemented. Uh, initially, even when they were implemented, the quality of mid meals was very low. It was, you know, just rice and salt or sometimes rice and turmeric. Uh, and it's uh, only over time that the state governments gradually started owning the scheme and really investing in it and improving it. And now we see uh, midday meals of reasonably good quality in many states. For example, uh, many states now have introduced eggs in midday meals, which is really a breakthrough because many children in India don't get uh, uh, proteins of good quality and eggs actually have not only good protein, but a lot of good nutrients for growing children. Uh, my vegan friends are not very happy with this, and I'm not entirely happy with, my, with it myself, but I do think it is a good program, and that uh, uh, the best way to champion the rights of uh, animals is not to prevent children from being well nourished. Uh, now, not only did this have a big impact on school attendance, dramatically so, right away, but over time, uh, there's a lot of evidence that the program also had an impact on child nutrition, uh, on uh, pupil achievements. Uh, it's also a good experience of socialization for children to learn to sit together and share a meal irrespective of class and caste and gender and so on and so on. And it's also a very big employment generation program for millions of poor women uh, in rural areas who are cooking uh, the midday meal in the local school for a very basic wage. In fact, at one point, I figured out that this was the biggest employment employ the midday sorry the midday meal program in India was the biggest employer in the world at that time, second to the U.S. Army. Uh, there has been a lot of research on this program, including incidentally by people who were based in Oxford at that time, like Abhijit Singh, who did some very interesting papers on this, and there is a lot of uh, uh, very convincing evidence of the positive effects of the program, certainly on uh, school attendance and child nutrition, and to some extent also on pupil achievements. Um, the academic research, however, came by and large uh, years after this was put in place, and that's, this would also apply to many of the social programs I have in mind, uh, like the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act and the National Food Security Act. So the research the, of a more academic sort uh, has also contributed very importantly, but typically uh, years after uh, the program were, programs were put in place. Um, some of the program, programs I have in mind have been uh, more controversial. Uh, Midday Meals, I think, today is reasonably well accepted as an uh, important feature of the schooling system in India, and the, the opposition to it has largely uh, disappeared. But some programs are still very controversial, in particular the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, uh, partly because it uh, tends to lead to an upward pressure on the market wages and give more bargaining power to the workers. And that is something that the employers, of course, whether it's the business community or the larger farmers, the contractors and so on, uh, tend to dislike. Uh, it's also that, objectively speaking, I think the benefits of that program have been less clear than those of the midday meal. I still feel the concept is wonderful. The basic idea is that if you don't have a job and you're not able to find a better means of livelihood, then you have a right to be employed on local public works within 15 days of demand. So if you demand work, you have to be given some work uh, on local public works, like, for example, uh, building roads, watershed programs, uh, digging wells, afforestation, and so on and so forth. And then you have a number of other rights also, like being paid within 15 days, uh, some basic work site facilities, an unemployment allowance if you're not given work, 
compensation if you are paid, uh, not paid within 15 days and so on and so forth. Uh, the concept appeals to me a lot, and I think there have been uh, some very substantial practical achievements as well. Uh, every year, something like 40 to 50 million families in rural India get some work under the Employment Guarantee Act. Uh, it has certainly contributed to poverty alleviation. It has contributed to bringing women out of their homes and giving them uh, an opportunity to earn their own income including in some parts of India where women have virtually no income earning, earning opportunities of their own. And it has also uh, led to the creation of a large number of uh, reasonably productive assets. For example, in Jharkhand, where I live, about 80,000 wells were built under the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. And these really, most of these wells are pretty well built and very well used. You can see that around the wells, people start uh, growing higher value crops and earning much better and also eating much better. So there have been some very significant achievements, uh, but also enormous implementation problems because it's a complex program, uh, very demanding for the local administration. And it has come up against this uh, indifference that I talked about earlier in the system towards working people. Uh, for example, when the wage, uh, wage, uh, wages are delayed, which happens very often and tends to really undermine the program because people then lose interest in working, uh, nobody really cares very much. I mean, it's basically the workers who are the victims and the people who could speed up the payments, whether it's the engineer or the local panchayat secretary or the banks, uh, don't particularly feel the pinch. Uh, so in the book, I write somewhere that this is a pro-worker law implemented by an anti-worker system, which may seem uh, like a harsh statement, but I do think uh, it applies by and large. Even the problem of corruption, which of course has been very important in this program and continues to be a big hurdle today, uh, is largely a reflection of the fact that you know the people who should be working to implement the program are often uh, much more interested in using it to make money for themselves rather than to enable people to exercise their right to work. Uh, it's also, so the, this feature, this lack of realization of people's rights and this lack of accountability in the system uh, is also partly a reflection of the weakness, if not the breakdown of the legal system. Uh, it's a remarkable fact that 10 years after the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act came into force, uh, to my knowledge, not a single worker has been to court to enforce their right, even though workers' rights are violated all the time. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people don't even get work, sometimes they're not paid the minimum wage, sometimes they are not paid on time, and so on and so forth. And uh, in principle, people have a, have a right to uh, go to court and to claim their legal entitlements. And they've never done it. I mean, once in a while, an NGO or uh, some public sp uh, spirited citizens do it, but the workers themselves don't do it, and that's because for them, the legal system is very remote. And in fact, they are, they are scared of the legal system because their, their experience of it is that it's a tool of harassment that tends to be used against them rather than in favor of them. So it's very difficult for them to access the legal system, of course, also expensive, and therefore they're not able to do it. So the idea of the idea that the act would uh, give people bargaining power and make the state accountable to them. I think that idea, or that part of the idea of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, uh, has only been realized to a very limited extent so far. Uh, when the act uh, was framed, I think the expectation was that it would lead to a proliferation of workers' organizations and that the Employment Guarantee Act would be an opportunity for unorganized workers to organize. Uh, but that has happened to a very limited extent. It has happened in certain areas uh, where there were serious efforts to mobilize the workers, uh, but otherwise it hasn't, and in particular the workers themselves uh, seem to be still finding it very difficult to organize uh, because the uh, Act doesn't, concretely speaking, uh, give them much bargaining power even today. For example, if they go on strike, uh, nobody really cares unlike public sector employees who can go on strike and paralyze uh, the, uh, uh, the place where they work and then force the government to act.
I'll just give one more example, uh, and this is the public distribution system, which is what the film is about. So under the public distribution system, uh, about two-thirds of the population in India now have a ration card, which gives them a legal entitlement to highly subsidized food grain, rice or wheat. Uh, in some states, they also get edible oil and pulses, but the uh, legal entitlement under the National Food Security Act is only to food grain, uh, five kilos per person uh, per month for what are called priority households, which is the bulk of the households. Um, the public distribution system used to have a very bad name in India and still has to some extent because of massive corruption. So if you go back 10 years in the state uh, where this film was shot, the state of Jharkhand in eastern India, at that time something like 80 to 90 percent of the food uh, meant to be distributed to poor families was siphoned off and sold in the market by corrupt dealers. Um, I remember that as recently as 2005, 12 years ago, my friend Harsh Mandar, who perhaps you have heard of, and was at that time uh, an IAS officer, a uh, highly placed uh, officer of the government of Chhattisgarh, also in eastern India, uh, used to tell us that one thing that will never improve in Chhattisgarh is the public distribution system. And the reason he was saying that is that he used to be a district collector and later on a divisional commissioner in Chhattisgarh, and he had tried on his own to reform the system, but he found that the nexus of uh, corrupt dealers and their protectors among the political parties uh, that had grown around the public distribution system was just too strong to be defeated. And so he felt that the system would never improve. Two years later, uh, the system was dramatically turned around by the government because it, for some reason, basically to get votes, uh, the political leaders made up their mind that uh, they would try to make the system work instead of colluding with the private dealers who were milking the system. And then the whole series of reforms were introduced and very rapidly uh, the system was turned around. Uh, so, the, so, so the state of Chhattisgarh was the first one, at least in North India, uh, to take the initiative of making the PDS, the public distribution system, work with very dramatic results. And then over time, some of the neighboring states like Orissa, West Bengal, later on Madhya Pradesh, and now even to some extent Jharkhand and Bihar, uh, have followed the same footsteps and uh, made the system work uh, very much better. Uh, and this is an important example of a larger point I try to make in different contexts in the book, which is the possibility of change. Uh, and again, it's not a change that has happened because some uh, researchers sat around the table and uh, presented some policy suggestions to the policymakers. It's a change that happened through democratic action and struggles of various kinds. But uh, when it does happen, it can turn a lot of things around. We have seen a lot of progress. Uh, in the, not only in the public distribution system, but also in midday meals, in the Employment Guarantee Act, in social security pensions. Of course, there are still uh, enormous shortcomings and inadequacy, inadequacies in all these programs, but at least the, policy, the possibility of change has been shown, and I think much more can happen in the future. Uh, there was a time not so long ago when uh, Kerala was thought to be a kind of exceptional and unique case of successful uh, social policy in India with much better education and health facilities than elsewhere. And it was thought, uh, firstly, that this would be very difficult for other states to emulate. And also there was a whole literature about what uh, might be the factors that uh, enabled Kerala to do things that no one else is doing, so some people said it was because of the history of matrilineal in Kerala or the history of um, missionary action, uh, the Communist Party and so on and so forth. There were all kinds of hypotheses. Uh, but what we have seen since then is that in fact many other states uh, have shown an ability uh, to emulate Kerala, if not in full measure, at least in substantial measure. And I'm increasingly convinced today uh, that uh, every state in India can ultimately become uh, like Kerala. Um, so this is, uh, these are some of the uh, positive messages of the book, the possibility of change. The evidence also that many of these programs are achieving something contrary to the uh, 
constant refrain in the mainstream media and especially in the business media that this is a waste of resources, that it creates dependence on the state and that there are much better t things to do uh, with uh, public resources. Uh, but uh, to end on a more cautionary note, I should also say that in the last few years, uh, there have been some important setbacks with many of these programs. There have been budget cuts, uh, there have been deliberate attempts to uh, undermine some of the programs. Uh, there has also been a continuing attack, uh, particularly on child nutrition programs from uh, commercial interests. So, so nothing is guaranteed. Uh, I think we can hope that in the future, uh, some of these basic foundations of a social security system in India that have been laid will be consolidated and expanded. But I don't think that we can take that for granted. And there's also a possibility of setbacks and uh, reversal to the system we had earlier, where people were, people were basically left to their own devices with very little social support. So I think I'll end here and look forward to any comments uh, you may have on the book or any questions that you may have. Uh, apologies, I have to disappear at two o'clock, so I'm not storming out in anger, I'm storming out uh, uh, for a coach. So this is about research for action, this is the big agenda of the book. Uh, by action, jean Drej means practical change. So I'm uh, an economist by background, I'm also the research director for the Department of Area Studies, but I'm going to respond to uh, Jean's uh, uh, call uh, with those two hats on. Uh, so Jean argues that research alone is not enough, that change also needs democratic action, and he argues research can contribute to more effective action. Now as a research director, Yes, you know, we're, as a university, we're interested in outreach. We're talking more about impact because we're told to by the research uh, assessment exercises. But the predominant thinking of economists is that they produce knowledge, so it is positive economics, and it's up to others to utilise uh, that knowledge. Uh, so Jean argues that for action to be effective, it's necessary for research to be presented in a clear and reader-friendly manner. <coughs> Economists will snigger a little bit at that statement. Uh, the Economics Department in Oxford, I'm not a member of, but the Economics Department in Oxford have a ranking of the top journals, and they're very clear in order to be promoted or for appointments, it's necessary to publish in those journals. When you look at those journals, these are the most densely mathematical, theoretical uh, journals, even among economics. I might take a little bit of an issue here with Jean. Um, I would suggest that academic uh, economic research does lead to action. I'll quote here from uh, a famous economist, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men, this was John Maynard Keynes writing 80 years ago, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slave of some defunct economist. So Keynes is arguing economic ideas do lead to action. I mean, I think you could see this quite clearly, something like the efficient market hypothesis, the belief, kind of long, very influential in financial economics, that financial markets are self-regulating. I think the problem is not that uh, there's a, a lack of action, that research is not leading to action. I think the problem is that economics research is leading to too narrow action, that the way economics research has been presented narrows the scope of that action and hinders, for example, democratic accountability or wider discussion of economics. Uh, Jean argues that research should think beyond the government as the main agent of change. And I think although um, economists do engage with other organisations, such as some work for Oxfam, I think clearly, as Jean pointed out, the dominant uh, point of interaction for economists is the state. And this is what economists do, they produce policy advice for the state. Uh, Jean argues that yeah, research informs action. I think universities are fine with this. Universities talk now a lot about impact of research. 
But also, Jean argues that action informs research. And this is, I think, as Jean argues, and I would agree with him, is something uh, that is much less common in academic disciplines. I think this argument that uh, action uh, hinders objectivity is quite a common one. Jean argues, for example, that an engagement with media, political parties, and the legal system helps us better understand democracy. Now, thinking of colleagues I've worked with, only a tiny fraction of my colleagues I've ever worked with have engaged in that matter, or in that manner. Um, Jean also points out, uh, this is something I think the university might raise, uh, might raise a few eyebrows, there is nothing like a few days in prison to see the state uh, from a new angle. Now, Gordon Brown quite recently argued that perhaps many more business people, economists, should have been sent to prison, uh, but I think he was talking about that from a slightly different perspective. So perhaps most uh, eyebrow-raisingly of all for universities and for research um, directors is that Jean argues uh, researchers should avoid obligations to funding agencies. <laughs> And I had a look at some data. 2015-2016, uh, Oxford uh, had 540 million pounds worth of obligations to external funding agencies, <laughs> and that is an absolute priority uh, as part of the university. It's increasing in how promotions, how appointments are judged, one's ability to acquire external funding. So, just a few uh, before I disappear, a few kind of points on the book. I've also previously read An Uncertain Glory by Dredge and Sen, published in 2013. If anything, I found that book to be a bit fatalistic. Masses of tables, masses of data, you know, one comes away you know, fairly convinced of their main point that India has experienced growth but hasn't experienced anything like enough human development. But this book I found to be much more passionate, much more positively passionate, it's passionate about public policy. What I found very interesting, it's discussion of Kerala and Himachal Pradesh. Sometimes we think, oh, Kerala's exceptional because of its particular historical circumstances. It had its progressive Maharajas. It had Christian missionaries that did particular things. It's odd in terms of its communism, its caste makeup. So Kerala is a unique historical model, and there's only limited things other countries, uh, other states can learn from that. But Jean is absolutely passionate and convinced of the point that other states can learn from the success story, Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, uh, or a couple of other states. He, he points out, for example, that the state of Bihar has made, although from very low levels, made some very rapid gains in terms of improvements in public policy and social indicators. I mean, these are perhaps not showing up at the moment, Bihar is moving from dysfunctional to less dysfunctional, but these in absolute terms are fairly dramatic gains relative to Bihar's own past. So this is a passionate book, not just set up in what we should despair about, perhaps, or what we should engage, what we should seek to influence, but it also celebrates success. Jean talks about the amazing revival of the public distribution system. He talks about the eggs in the midday meals. He talks about the successes of the right to information uh, campaign. But one of the things that most struck me, I mean, as an economist, I, my fieldwork consisted of having a cup of coffee and downloading data. You know, an economist increasingly obsessed with randomised control trials that involve lots of people, lots of money to run them, and uh, take months to engage with. You know, randomized, stratified, sampling, you know, the things get ever more complicated. But all, what I liked about John's approach was his effort to simplify the whole process of research. Yes, all this other evidence is, is useful, but talking and personal experience, there's an immense value to that. So complex methodologies are useful, but one can miss important knowledge by being over-reliant on them. For example, he he talked about bullet trains, but based his opinions on bullet trains from having personal experience of the problems and pleasures of travelling on existing trains in India. Um, I liked his thoughts about the functioning of democracy in India based on his discussions with people outside polling booths. I think perhaps my most, most memorable example here was he questioned the rationality assumption of economics that all people are rational, one of the key foundational assumptions of economics. 
and he based his critique, or he based his knowledge here, of Bollywood films, pointing out that sacrifice, revenge, love, kindness, lust, etc., are all important drivers of human motivation. So these are 40 shortish chapters, four pages, five pages. This is a very accessible book. It's engaging, it's lucid, it's provocative. Um, it might horrify research departments and universities, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's not just about public policy, because the work we most clearly associate Jean Dredge with, but it, wide, it ranges much wider. Uh, it talks about the Gujarat model, bullet trains, uh, nuclear weapons, and the problem with Kashmir. And I'm very glad to see that although other academic disciplines are trying to steal John away, uh, make a claim on him, the book uh, makes frequent reference to game theory, so I'm delighted that John is still an economist at heart. <laughs> When I was reading this book, I started to just really like it because it's so well written. So I'm actually going to talk about this as a writer rather than a, a live writer. That's okay. No, that's fine. So, you know, I think that so we've got some people from OUP in the room. There is a wonderful biography waiting to be written of Jean Dres. Right? Uh, that, as far as I, I Wikipedia did, you know, in depth research, and as far as I can see, no one's written a proper biography. He is a fascinating man. You know, you've, someone's got to get out there and actually spend time with John and actually write the biography. Just in passing, I, I teach at the LSE as well as work at Oxfam, and um, someone just said, oh, John Dres, that's the guy who slept rough in Lincoln Fields when he came to lecture here. If that is true, it's biographical gold dust. You know, we need to check that kind of thing. Um, uh, the way he writes, when reading this book, I started to think this is India's George Orwell. Right? The way he writes, I mean, he quotes Orwell at the beginning, of the book, and the style is very reminiscent of George Orwell. Apologies for the Anglo-centrism of these remarks, but George Orwell <laughs> is one of my heroes, okay? Um, so he's got this, yes, he's angry at the injustices he sees, but he's, he's got this kind of very forensic eye for policy detail. He's, he writes very crisply, very sparsely, that it's not overblown, sort of florid at all. It's very, very Orwellian uh, in the style. Um, but, uh, but he's better than Orwellian that he's got economics. And he's actually in the room during a lot of these policy processes. So he's like sort of Orwell plus, which is pretty impressive, really, I think, for any writer. Um, I really did like the research for action stuff. I want, one of my shortest interviews was with the head of research at DFID when I went in to say, I've come to talk to you about research for advocacy. And he says, mm, that's an oxymoron. You can either do research or you can do advocacy, but you can't do both. It was a very <coughs> short meeting. And it's great to hear somebody like jean Dres say, actually, that's wrong. Um, and I really like this bit that the action actually improves the quality of the research. That does seem like a new contribution to the, the endless discussion about impact. Um, it's very... Yeah, OK, I'm not an expert on, on, on the subcontinent, and I'm, I bow to a lot of people in the room, but it feels very Indian in, in its combination of public debate, judicial activism, and deep solidarity with poor communities. Um, and I, I really liked that. Um, yeah, there's, there's some of these court cases, like you just mentioned in passing, I think that the right to food case has been going on for 16 years. Yeah, these are proper... This is, judicial activism is not for the faint-hearted, but in, India's the kind of world leader on it. Um, and he's had extraordinary roles in things like the, the creation of the Employment Guarantee Act, although he's very modest about it. Um, and then lastly, I like the fact that he's not shrill. He's not oppositional. He actually finds things to celebrate, even about the state of the healthcare system in, in India, which yeah, takes a deep optimism. I think. <laughs> um, uh, and... and he, he is actually remarkably restrained about the current government. So most of my friends in India love nothing better than a bit of Modi bashing, right? And he doesn't do that. I mean, he may well do it in the privacy of his own home, but he doesn't do it when he's writing in public. And I think that's just very wise. Um, and he's looking, for, he's looking at the policies and the substance rather than taking sides and making a big noise. Um, the final thing, because you have to be a little bit critical, is it's also Indian in some other senses, very Indian in some other senses. So the basic players in this system are the people and the state. Right? The private sector comes on occasionally as a kind of pantomime villain. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the private sector comes and tries to eat up 
the subsidies or corrupt the state or scam things and, and sort of destroy politics. Now, that may well be the truth in India, but um, it, it is quite a sort of... Uh, Looking at it from my point of view, there are lots of, lots of other things happening with the private sector which are worth looking at. Um, and he himself acknowledges that environmental issues are not the strong point in the book. In fact, they are totally absent. Um, and that things like climate change, you know, he may get on to it sometime because he hasn't finished writing yet, is what he says in the book. It's an absolutely wonderful book, and I think I really want to read the biography when it's out. Someone could just write that, please. Thank you. Okay. I'm very happy to share my reflections on Professor Dietrich's new book. It was an extremely interesting read, and it summarizes the progress of social policy and welfare schemes in India over the last 20 years. And the text is easily accessible and presents co complex figures of social development in an easy-to-understand manner, which is very important, I think, because there's always so much confusion around any new policy that comes out in India. And the, the part that I liked the most was that it beautifully connects the different social schemes and shows how they impact each other. For example, better education can cause better health and better nutrition can enable better participation in school. And that can further people coming to school, like children coming to school can help to curb caste boundaries in, at which plague India. India. India is inherently a very unjust and divisive society. I also found the book to be very optimistic because, you know, you see the progress of social policies over the last 20 years with different stakeholders grassroots activists, civil society actors coming together to push forward the Right to, Secure, right to Food Act and uh, the, the Employment Guarantee Act. And you see them kind of, they, you see them happening, being legislated into practice, even though all recommendations are not taken into uh, consideration. Even if uh, part of it is, that's a huge achievement, I think. Um, the description of Koila Wallace at the beginning of the book reminded me of uh, Howrah Junction, where if you are passing by any time, mm -hmm. you will see a lot of migrant men carrying almost no luggage, sitting on their haunches on the platform, waiting for the next train to take them to Delhi or Bombay or wherever. And they're all migrating to find work because there's nothing to do in the villages. They cannot find any productive work in the villages. And Professor Dre says something which is very important. I think he says that migration is like a game of Russian roulette. And sometimes migration, migrating for work, work can be fatal. Uh, I would like to give this example of agricultural workers from tribal belt of Madhya Pradesh, from uh, places like Jhabua, Dhar, and Dehi in tribal Madhya Pradesh. And because uh, the NREJ was not implemented well in Madhya Pradesh by the government, rains failed, crops failed, and the workers had to migrate to Gujarat to work in the stone quarrying industries. And uh, the industry was heavily unregulated because of which the workers got silicosis from the silica dust that comes from the from uh, breaking the stones and when they came back they either died within six months because it's incurable or they had severe physical dis deformities which prevent them, prevented them from working properly. So I think NREGA is very essential and we need to see that how it can prevent big disasters. Um, now this also connects me to my next point uh, where Professor Dres mentions in the book that uh, NREGA can also be seen as a skill formation activity. And it is indeed true that people acquire various kinds of skill, but I would also like to know where the story ends, when they move into the private sectors to work as contract workers after acquiring these skills. I would like to know what Professor Dres thinks about the terms of employment on which these people work when they go into the private sector. Even though they may get better wages in the private sector, but uh, is there any career progression as such? Because they, they have the skills, but they don't have the right kind of jobs, or the number of jobs are really few in the private sector. Um, now coming to the next point in terms of solidarity, because uh, the book is about sense and solidarity, uh, Professor Dres says that universalization can help to break these barriers of caste and class when there's a large number of people being affected by it. For example, in Tamil Nadu, the services, service delivery is better. So I also wanted to uh, just uh, add my two cents that uh, Professor Dres says that in Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Himachal Pradesh, women have been very active in politics and women have been very active also in the provision of these service services, which has enabled which has probably made the government f brought the government's focus on these social policies and also uh, really made them very competent and efficient. I would also like to say it, maybe the, south, the states in south of India they are better at uh, they are better at uh, vocalizing. Uh, it's not only the women, but it's also the self-respect movement of the Dalits, which happened in South India, which probably has a role also to play because uh, lower caste people were aware of their rights and they have uh, substantially substantially fought to uh, get access to these things. Um, so, also this thing about civil society being, so Professor Dres mentioned that civil society is, uh, uh, it is, it is uh, populated by upper caste people. I also think it's something which probably is implied uh, is that it's also Anglophone. So there are a lot of vernacular language uh, uh, 
active, I mean, vernacular uh, language uh, uh, newspapers, which are more active in bringing out issues and more brave. At the same time, there are also lots of activists and grassroots workers who are working in the, uh, who are, when their main language is uh, the local language that they speak in. So I think the civil society is also disconnected because it's very Anglophone. Uh, and now, at the last, I would like to speak about the role of technology in programs like Aadhaar and how technology is not easily accessible in most parts of India and most people don't know how to operate it and uh, it's easier when they're working with the registry or something which is known to them, something that they can identify and work with. And Professor Khera says that it is not an identity fraud but a quantity fraud which prevents people from getting access to, uh, access to ration in the PDS system. So I think the government seems to be getting away with eye-washing the public <coughs> and often technology can come at a huge cost. For example, uh, during demonetization, I was in doing my field work in Delhi and I saw lots of these informal workers did not know how to operate, uh, did not know how to carry on online cash transactions and there was this entire commission economy springing up around it because people who knew how to use this, use uh, uh, internet or uh, uh, computers, they would charge almost like a 20% high commission to help these people make these transactions. So these are some of the points that I would like to make. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the dangers of being the last speaker is that all the good points have been made, so please bear with me if some of the things I'm repetitive. Um, I, I am doing a deal in this department, but I don't work on de development economics. Uh, I work on political parties, and that's the vantage point that I would like to come from. I was trained as an economist in my undergrad degree, whereas when I first encountered Jean Dres's work, I do have an abiding respect for the dis discipline of economics, but I will sort of come at it from the vantage point of somewhere between economics and studying political parties. So in the limited time that I have today, I will do two things. One, I will offer two reasons why I think if someone in the audience hasn't read John Dress's work, should pick up this book and take it seriously. And then I'll offer one point of observation that stayed with me even after reading the book, and I would want to see if um, perhaps uh, John Dress can say something about that. Um, so two reasons, and this might sound trite, but I really, I'm, I will sound like a fanboy here, but I mean, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, so the first reason. So I remember reading somewhere that Alex uh, Kainkons, who used to be the economic advisor to Her Majesty's government in the 1960s, said that economic advisors around the world work on, work on the basis of a myth. And that myth is called the myth of the philosopher down the corridor, which is that economic advisors around the world will go on with their careers, and they'll think there's a philosopher sitting somewhere down the corridors of Whitehall who will provide a moral and ethical opinion on government schemes, and whereas the econ economists in the room can only talk about what is the most efficient policy out there. And I think Jean Dres's book really emphasizes that ethical and moral considerations can't be divorced from uh, policy making. I mean, as someone who scouts the websites of DFID and Niti Aayog and Planning Commission for job vacancies, I'm yet to come across a job listing for a moral philosopher, but one lives on hope. So the two that they can't be divorced, and if should we choose to ignore morals and ethics, we do it at our own peril. Uh, the second good thing about the book is, of course, you've already heard a lot about it from uh, Jean himself, which is the point on using experience as evidence. Now, this might sound like, you know, this is, uh, you know, rehashing the debates on qualitative versus quantitative or large end study versus case study, but this is really what, not what it's about. Uh, if you read the book, you will understand the, I, I think it's much beyond the call versus con debate. Using field experience as something that can inform our research as, and more importantly, our action. Uh, those of us who are interested in development policy. Um, so in the last uh, few minutes that I have left, um, what I will say is one question that this book left me, notwithstanding all its strength and all its merits. Uh, in the book, Jean Dres gives us evidence from all the states in India, and he is quite charitable about pointing out success where it has happened. So whether it is Anganwadi workers in Tamil Nadu, the success of PDS in Chhat Chhattisgarh, or primary schools in Himachal Pradesh, he tells us success has happened in the past one or two decades. Uh, and he says that wherever there is political will, uh, the success of one state can be mapped onto another state. But the question that I was left with is that how do we understand political will? Can we just take it as a given? Or can John Dress have the fact that he has had a ringside seat as a National Advisory Council member in India, he's had a ringside seat towards understanding the minds of our political leaders. Can he tell us where does political will come from? Or can we just take it for a given? Um, there is a lot of optimism in the book, but that is something that I think is still to be said from the vantage point that Jean Dres occupies. Um, there's a lot, I mean, if should he write another book, I would recommend, other than a biography, of course, would be uh, sort of an expose of the NAC years as an insider who saw it at very close quarters. So those are my two cents. Thank you.
think these were very generous comments, uh, and there's not a lot that I should be responding to. Just a couple of things. Um, uh, Keynes, actually, it's true, he had a lot of faith in the power of ideas, but he was uh, quite a different kind of economist uh, from uh, uh, the role models of today, and in particular, he actually had a lot, a lot of experience and did a lot of hands-on work. Um, so I think he would have certainly supported the idea that uh, experience is as important as, uh, as important as evidence for enlightened public policy and can even be considered as a form of evidence. And if I can tell I turn in quoting him from memory, so it may not be in the exact words, uh, he said something to the effect that if economists could be thought of as humble and competent people on par with dentists, that, we, that would be wonderful. Uh, so I think he also had a sense of the fact that uh, there are limits to our expertise, and that if we think of ourselves as experts who have all the answers, then uh, that can be quite dangerous. So I, 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 that, that really fits with my belief that economists have very important contributions to make, including from RCTs and statistical analysis and so on and so forth. But we have to be aware of the limitations of our discipline and even of some of the blinkers and biases that we develop by studying and practicing economics, economics and therefore be willing to engage with others and be part of the democratic process that leads to public policy. Um, then there was... Uh, uh, something about, uh, well, I didn't quite say that we should avoid obligations to funding agencies. In that paragraph, I also acknowledge that there are funding agencies that are comparatively, uh, that have some principles and ethics. So I, I realize that research cannot be done without any money, and that some people are in a position where they, where they have to uh, rely on funding agencies. But I do think that conflicts of interest are rampant now in academic research, and that this is an issue that we need to think about and that there are ways of developing uh, ethical, independent uh, funding mechanisms that would be uh, appropriate, more appropriate if you're interested in uh, research for action. Uh, somebody from DFID was quoted in disapproval to the effect that you have to choose between research and advocacy. I don't think it's completely wrong, even though I do believe in research for action. I think that research and action have their own methods, and I don't necessarily advocate mixing the two. I'm saying that if you want to make, uh, you want your research to have an impact and lead to practical change, then you have to go beyond academic papers and engage with democratic action. And I'm also saying that you can learn a lot from action. I think that's something that is very important. Uh, but I don't necessarily advocate uh, casual mixing of research and action because I think research has its own methods uh, and doesn't always gel very well with uh, street action or going to prison or whatever it is. And then uh, uh, I think Duncan was not terribly happy with my um, view of the private sector. I, I'm very much in favor of the private non-profit sector. I think there's a lot of wonderful happen things happening in the private non-profit sector. I can see that this is not going to satisfy you and that you perhaps think that the profit sector is also important. Yes, it is important. But I think that in the field of social policy, and certainly in India, uh, the corporate sector has been a bit of a nuisance. And it's not very difficult to understand. I mean, basically, uh, I mean, we, we can see, for example, the, the corporate sponsored media, which is quite an influential part of the media, uh, tends to disparage all these social programs. And my guess is that it's because uh, they know that if this, the government spends more on uh, social policy, then there will be less money, well, there will be, well, there'll be either higher, higher taxes or higher interest rates or less money for uh, infrastructure of the sort that the corporate sector favors or corporate handouts and so on. So it's kind of straight interests uh, uh, and obviously uh, the corporate sector has no particular reason to support programs addressed to poor people. So I think we, we feel that a lot here because uh, we're constantly uh, battling a certain amount of uh, hostile propaganda that comes largely from there. Uh, and then on top of that, as I said, there, were, there are also some cases of practical attempts to undermine or invade pro public programs like uh, mid meals or for that matter the integrated child development services, which are very serious. Uh, but obviously that does not prevent um, 
corporate leaders to from contributing in the social field if they wish. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, uh, no, sorry, the last point, the political will, I think that was an important point. So I don't tend to use the word political will very much. I don't think it's used in the book because it's too much of a kind of black box. I mean, you're right to say, where does it come from? Uh, so I prefer to think of public policy as being an outcome of democratic action and democratic practice and political will as being produced by democratic action. Um, so if you want uh, the government interests, if you want me to give an example right now, there's a tremendous lack of political will for the entitlements and National Food Security Act, which came into force in 2013. All pregnant women in India are now entitled to cash benefits of 6,000 rupees per child, uh, but the government is just doing nothing about it. So obviously there's a lack of political will. But we can't wait for that will to happen on its own. We have to create it through, uh, you know, uh, pushing all the doors, uh, going to court maybe, or advocacy, writing, research, uh, street action, and basically using all the democratic means that we have. Uh, so political will is a, is a part of the process. It doesn't, it's not from where you start. Okay, I'm sorry, I've already talked too much. I'd like to hear some uh, comments or questions from the audience, and I have time. Who goes first?